Hello, I'm David Yetman. Welcome to our lecture series sponsored by the Southwest Center of the University of Arizona and the Learning Curve Adult Education. We are right in the heart of the COVID pandemic and still wearing masks, but I'm here with my friend and celebrity chef, Janos Wilder. We're more than six feet apart, so Janos, let's take them off. All right. Food preparation requires more than masks. Yes. It requires, the lecture today it requires is, these gloves I've got to put on. <laughs> the lecture today is presented by Jennifer Jenkins, a colleague of mine at the Southwest Center. Jennifer is an expert on filmmaking, particularly the history of filmmaking in Latin America and Southern Arizona, and has some unusual stories about films that were done in Southern Arizona in the border area. Please keep in mind that all the proceeds from this series go toward help for the Border Restoration Project, which works with peoples on the border and especially indigenous peoples in Mexico who have been affected by the virus. Well, Jennifer uh, has a special request for food and you're gonna have to explain that one well, to Well, so me. we were talking about this and would it be food that would, might have been portrayed in the films at that time? No, we, no. What, might, what would be the snacks? that you might have. This is Back in snacks. 1925. Yes, or much, or even, even earlier. earlier. Yeah, so, so, so this is about snacks. So we're gonna do three different things. I've got steaming in here tamales. Just, they're right there, they're gonna go for a little while, they'll be fine. So it's interesting, all around the United States, and from early 1900s to, I'm not sure when this ended, the, tamales were street food. And that people would go around with buckets of with coals burning in the bottom and then something, a little fit, you know, a little screen over the top, and then tamales that had been steamed and they were just kept hot, and they would peddle tamales all around town. That was true here in Tucson. So the, the theater district was in, in, in the western side of, of Congress Street and in between the theaters there were Chinese restaurants and you'd have people going up and down the street hawking tamales. So tamales was something that, that's, an, that's kind of, yeah. Was this before absolutely. you'd go to the theater? During or after? Or all three? I don't know that. We're gonna find out. <laughs> we're gonna find out. Maybe all three. So because they could have brought them in with them, right? So now how about popcorn? So this is gonna be a little different. We're going to pop corn on the cob, and we're going to do it in the microwave. That's a scary thought. Yes, it is a scary thought. So do you have your hard hat, too? You might want that. We don't know. I have my, we, my COVID mask. This has, I'm not sure that I was going to do it for this. We, so this particular item here is not what you generally look think, oh my god, Hope the hell they're not using one of those in Yanos's kitchen that you'd never see one hit there. Well, well, in fact, the kernels look like popcorn, but we're gonna put it nothing in else here does. and we're gonna let it go for a minute 30. Boom, and you're gonna start hearing it pop in just a minute. Now, I am going to well, turn this up and I'm gonna put, make some butter for that popcorn. Seems like a lot of butter, doesn't it? It's not enough. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> so I'm gonna melt this butter. I've already toasted this red chili, red chili powder from, hear that popping? I hear the popping. That's pop a popcorn. I've already toasted the, the red chili. That's gonna keep on popping. I'm gonna add garlic here. Oh, that's a lot of garlic. I, a little bit of cumin, not too much cumin, because cumin can overpower pretty much anything. It's going away, it's it, doing it's, its thing. It sounds like machine gun fire in it, there. It does. This is lime zest, so we just, with a microplaner, we just took the zest off the lime. 
a little bit of salt. All right. Oh my God. Okay, that's what we're looking for. All right, I'm gonna just turn this off. Let's see what we have here now. Okay, so what do we have here? Popcorn, oh, popcorn. Look at that. And popcorn on the cob. <laughs> I've never seen that before. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? So how fun, right? So we're gonna just put now this, do they call this in Mexico, they call this palomitas? I do not know. I think so, but so I've never so seen it is... popped on the cob. So we're gonna pour a little of this butter in here. This is sort of the same flavor as if you had, um, um, you know, street vendors corn, fresh roasted corn, and you get all your little condiments. So these flavors, that's the flavor profiles that I was going for with this. A little bit more. We've got our cob right there. Put that over here. And then a little cotijo cheese over the top to kind of melt in there. And you're gonna to want to try this later. Okay, we'll just put that right there. So, this is not run-of-the-mill popcorn. No. No. All right, this is no. Yano's popcorn. Well, and you know, so in Native Seeds, that's one of the seeds that we collected was for popping corn. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's where I really got the idea for, for And where did that. these um, ears come these from? These actually came from Indiana uh -huh. because they're not a part of the grow out this year for Native Seeds, but I still wanted to do this. So now... We've got tamales. So I've been steaming these are meat tamales, homemade meat tamales, someone's home, not mine. So you could take these little packets into the theater with you, unwrap them in the theater and just eat them like you might, you know, a burrito or something. Now, so you're getting your range of snack food here, David, but what's missing? I think what's missing is ice cream. Well, it was, I mean, how can you possibly have popcorn and tamales without ice cream? Without ice cream. So this, I believe this is a flavor that they didn't have in the 1900s. I could be wrong. This is dark chocolate jalapeno ice cream that I make. But I thought, what the hell, I'm gonna put this down here, you can grab it, and I want you to just taste that ice okay, cream. Okay, this is a Yano's creation. This is a Yano's creation. I've been making this since the early 80s. You did it. It's got a little heat yeah. there. It's got just the right amount of Jalapeno? Yeah, jalapeno. And Mexican chocolate? No, no. This Actually, this is French chocolate. French chocolate. Yep. And I think um, I'm glad you gave me this, and I'll see you later. Okay, <laughs> that's for you. That's for you. So this is what you might have had, some sort of arrangement like this, maybe not that flavor, but you'd have popcorn, you'd have tamales, you'd have ice cream when you went to see the, the Takis, or probably that was before the Takis. It's the Takilises. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jennifer will explain that. Yeah. But this, this is what you might have had on Congress Street in Tucson around the turn of the century. Well, Jennifer, I'm sorry, uh, but all of the uh, chocolate jalapeno ice cream is gone, so you'll have to give your lecture just hoping that someday you can try it. Thanks, Dave and Janos, for that wonderful introduction. Those are yummy snacks, and um, I'm really feeling the social distancing 10 miles away. 
when I don't get to try the elote popcorn and the jalapeno dark chocolate ice cream. Dave, I know you're going to eat all of it. <laughs> so, um, hi, I'm Jennifer Jenkins and I'm here to talk to you about the early history of cinema in Tucson. And the question of what people ate in the movie theaters was a really good one and opened up a new area for me to research. So I'm grateful to Janos for that. Um, one of the things I discovered, and I'll show you a couple of maps in a minute, is that all of Congress Street was peppered with Chinese restaurants. Uh, from the Southern Pacific Depot West, there were an unprecedented number of Chinese restaurants. Um, and as Janos mentioned, tamale vendors would have been pretty much in any, everywhere and anywhere on a shopping street. Um, the elote, the popcorn, what a great idea. And the, the dark chocolate jalapeno ice cream. Yeah, those are definitely millennial tastes, aren't they? <laughs> I'm not sure the, the moviegoers of the 1890s would have gone for those tastes. Uh, their tastes tended to be, you know, sort of 1890s American diner food, which was pretty horrible. Everything was covered in brown sauce. It's one of the reasons Fred Harvey was so successful when he started his string of Harvey houses along the Southern Pacific and Santa Fe Railroad lines because people actually got decent food to eat. So, what would people have eaten in the movie theaters of the day? Well, probably they would have brought in anything they did snack on, possibly fruit and hard candy in addition to a <laughs> tamale in your pocket, or um, possibly some popcorn, which was something of a craze since the um, 1893 World's Fair. So, you know, you, you don't really know for sure. One thing we do know is that concessions weren't really sold in the movie theaters and concession, concession stands as we know them until the depression. And as soon as the depression hit, movie theater managers had to figure out a way to get people in the door and offering snacks right there on site and during the intervals was one way to invite people in. Of course, you probably know about all the other promotional, you know, dish night and contests and such. But concessions stands, as we know them, seem to be a function of the Depression. And indeed, the Fox Theater, which opened in 1930, had uh, a really stunning concession stand in its lobby from the beginning. So that's a little bit of an introduction, and um, if you'll join me now for the lecture, we'll regroup on Zoom for Q&A afterwards. Thanks for joining us, and thanks again to Dave and Janos for that wonderful lead-in. See you in a minute. Hi again, Jennifer Jenkins here. As you see, I'm a member of the Southwest Center, colleague of Dave's, and um, I'm also a member of the Department of English, which is where film history and film studies resides at the University of Arizona. So today I'm going to be talking to you about the small town that sustained several big screens in the early history of cinema in Tucson. We're going to be looking at cinema going as well as movie making in the silent era. Um, if, you, if you're hoping for a survey of films made at Old Tucson, well, that's a topic for another day. But um, all of this made it possible for people to conceive of the dream that was Old Tucson. So let's get started. We're going to spend a few moments with Sanborn Maps. And if you only know Sanborns as the insurance company when you rent a car or travel in Mexico, um, before they did that, they made insurance maps or fire maps for many, many small and large towns in the U.S. And the maps were keyed by what kind of material structures were made of. So this is the Sanborn map, and I should say Sanborn maps are an incredible treasure trove for people doing historical research. So if you live in an older home, you might be able to find your house on a a Sanborn map and um, you know see how the streets originally ran, what materials it was made of originally and then maybe modified over time. 
This is Tucson in 1886, and as you see, the majority of the economic center of Tucson runs north and south along Main Street, the old Camino Real that went to Mexico. You see the river over there in blue? Yes, it actually had water in it in those days. And on the far left, you can see the theater that's marked off at, is sort of at the end of the line. It was a brewery and theater that people were able to access fairly easily from uh, living right there in town. Now, the thing to know about Sanborn Maps is all of those brown buildings are adobe structures. The red buildings or pink buildings are brick. Yellow is frame and therefore highly flammable. <laughs> And many of the um, buildings are labeled as to what kind of establishment or residence occupied that space. This was really important to firefighters, of course, because they needed to know what was inside and was it something flammable. It becomes more important in the age of cinema because early film was highly flammable and so uh, firefighters needed to know where the movie theaters were in case there was a fire nearby. I want to draw your attention particularly to the circled area there on the right hand map. That is the block between Congress and Pennington and Stone and Church Streets. And as you see there's a little slice out of it there at the bottom and it says Maiden Lane. And if you look at the that block and the block to the west and the block to the east of it and it forms a kind of wedge and in fact that area was called the wedge in those days in the 1880s and 1890s and it was a pretty exciting place to be that's where the prostitutes hung out that's where the um, dive bars were which might sound a little familiar actually and eventually Maiden Lane was filled in about the time that Steinfeld and company set up their uh, emporium on the on the north side of that block and buildings started changing and um, brick structures started to be built but here in the roaring 80s uh, about the time of the coming of the railroad came in 1880 and here is 1886 uh, most of Tucson was still adobe so I want you to kind of keep this in mind and then we'll look at a couple of maps moving closer to the 20th century. So here we have the Sanborn map 15 years later from 1901 and this is the east end of Congress and Pennington um, ending in the Southern Pacific Railroad Depot which you see there in the northeast corner of the map and the sort of spaghetti strands of the rail lines behind it. To the northwest of the depot is the Sanavir Hotel and Tool Avenue, which as you know runs right there along um, in front of the depot. And the streetscape has changed quite a bit now, <laughs> but, but the basic layout's pretty much the same. What you see in this map is uh, a growing number of brick buildings occupying the what really came to be the commercial center, right? So you're getting more and more permanent structures, although adobe is pretty permanent as we know from uh, our churches that have been adobe for 300 years. But right there across from the depot we have, and the depot itself, um, frame structures designated in yellow. And while the depot was um, stuccoed nonetheless. It was a frame structure and flammable. Same with Sanavir Hotel, which did burn down. And then you see the smattering of smaller adobe structures reminding us that Tucson was Mexico for quite some time before it joined the United States. And it's not part of the United States yet on this map. In the furthest west block of Congress, it's East Congress, but in this map, the furthest west block, right smack in the middle of the block, you see a rather large footprint of a brick building and a blue line going north and then east, and that is the Tucson Opera House, which we're going to look at a little more closely 
in a moment. It um, was the major entertainment venue it, from the time it was built in the 1870s until it was finally converted into the State Theater in the 1950s and then closed and torn down subsequent to that during urban renewal times in the 1960s. So that's a space that's been occupied for quite a long time as an entertainment venue. But along Congress, you'll see, you know, there aren't so many buildings between the Opera House and the Depot. And what's there are little um, bars and hostelries and Chinese restaurants. So let's look a few years further uh, in the future. Although I will note, by 1901, the railroad's been here for um, 20 years, and cinema is now a going concern. Coming um, out of France in 1896 and coming to the United States in 1897. So we will see where that cinema um, presentation or the screenings occurred in the next slide. So here we are in 1919, so 18 years after the last map and 23 years after the coming of cinema. And what I've done here with these brick structures with the call-outs is go in with my yellow highlighter to, to uh, highlight that it says moving pictures. Again, Sanborn maps were made specifically as fire insurance and aids to uh, fire departments. Now, why would they need to know where the movie theaters were? Well, as I mentioned briefly, uh, in the early days of cinema, everything was shot on cellulose nitrate film, and cellulose nitrate film was highly, highly flammable. That's one of the reasons that we don't have very many extant films from this period. Many of them were junked, but there were also huge studio library fires, and when nitrate burns, it burns until everything's gone because in the process of burning it creates its own oxygen. There are astonishing films of nitrate film burning under water. The Navy did experiments during World War II and by golly it will burn until it burns out. So you can imagine what effect that might have on a city block. Now that said, um, people tend to be very frightened of nitrate film in archives and libraries, but it, it really very, very rarely self-combusts. Usually these big archive fires that you've heard about have happened through human error, not because it's just sitting there and goes kaflooey. So anyway, let's look at Congress Street. Oh, and I should mention too that the um, Sanborn maps, you know, they're, they're huge folio size map books that are probably almost three feet by two and a half feet. So each page is enormous and you can see all of the notations, but they don't shrink down super well and they're not um, aligned from page to page. You have to do your own alignments. So this is patching together three different large pages so that we can have a sense of the um, the cityscape as it grew. Again, you see the the railroad station down there on the far east side, and look at how many railroad lines there are now, and we have a brick station. San Javier Hotel is gone, replaced by brick structures. The um, brick structure across the street is what's going to come to be known as the uh, Triangle Building. And then all those little adobe structures directly across from the depot are little restaurants and bars. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, you can see the Tucson Opera House here. And I did this call out so you could see. You take the blue path off the city street right there on, on Congress along a little sort of alleyway and go in on the side to this giant auditorium that seated over 1,200 people. And it wasn't exclusively a dedicated motion picture house. They had operas there before movies, long before movies. They had traveling performers, vaudeville, um, Spanish language theater, a couple nights a week. 
um, zarzuelas, all sorts of things that would be of interest to the Tucson community in all of its diversity. In the front of the um, opera house, kind of on the floor level, I guess you might say, was the white uh, MCA. So, you know, different uses for this large, large structure. And then if you look at the top, there's an area there where there's balcony seating and um, a stage and then a place for scenery to be stored. And of course, scenery is flammable, so the firemen would need to know that. You also see yellow um, porches along the front on the streetscape, right? Little yellow dabs, and those just show that each of those street front businesses had its own little porch or awning. Moving west, you see the home of Albert Steinfeld and Company, um, current site of the Tucson Public Library Main Library Building. And then moving further west, you see a motion picture house on the corner of Congress and Meyer. And then on the south side of Congress, there's another moving picture house and again, called out and noted so that firemen would know where to go if there's a fire in that area. The one thing on the um, south side of Congress, back over by the depot that I want you to notice is um, the Rialto Theater hasn't been built yet. It, it opened in 1920, so we know where it's going to be, but it's not there yet. There's some sort of frame structure that will fall to the beautiful Rialto brick building. But at the corner of 5th Street and Congress is, sorry, 5th Avenue and Congress is a brick building with a roof garden. And the note on there says, open air moving pictures during summer months. Now that's where the playground bar is now with a roof garden, with open air moving pictures during summer months. So I find it a great irony that lo these many almost what well actually 101 years later that particular corner is occupied by the exact same thing although it wasn't continuously occupied in that way but from its start in 1919 until its present time at least in 1919 the playground was there and the roof garden was used for moving pictures which it makes me really, really happy as a film historian to know that <laughs> people are still watching movies in the way they ought to be. A very quick history of the beginnings of cinema and the moving image that will get us to Tucson in 1898 and 7. Antoine and Louis Lumiere were light bulb manufacturers in Lyon, France, and their father, Auguste, had been to Paris and seen Edison's kinetoscope, which was a, a viewing box with moving images inside it. And he asked his sons, Antoine and Louis, to figure out how to get it outside the box to find a way to project the image, and they invented the cinematograph, which is outside the box. And it's a much better business model in many ways. Edison's kinetoscope meant, you know, one, one penny, one viewer, but you had to have many pieces of equipment for people to look into the viewing box. The cinematograph could show um, a projected moving image on a screen to a room of, you know, up to probably 50 people in the beginning and each one of them would pay for a single screening. So the cinematograph was a genius piece of machinery. You, it was a camera and it was a projector. So you, it allowed for same day shooting, processing and exhibition of films and that became the bread and butter of the Lumiere um, and what later became the Passé a film company that they would send photographers all around the world and they would shoot and exhibit on the same day. The earliest films that the Lumiere's took were called factory gate films because they set up the camera across the street from their light bulb factory and filmed the um, workers leaving at the end of the day and then showed them 
So the working class was shown to a working class audience. The very first commercial screening was the 28th of December, 1895 in Paris. This is a Cinematograph and it's the one owned by the Kolb brothers. This is in the museum at Grand Canyon and this is the very one that the Kolb brothers took down the river. So these were pretty hardy little machines despite the fact that they had highly flammable nitrate based film in them. Well, here's a photograph of Congress Street hosting a parade in 1897, and there you see the Opera House on the far left side of the frame. On the right, we have Fourth of July celebrated in Tucson. And how are we going to pay for that? Well, the Tucson Opera House, A.V. Grossetta manager, is going to host the great and only cinematograph exhibiting the very best moving pictures ever seen in Tucson. Indeed, this may be the first moving pictures ever seen in Tucson. Saturday, June 11th, Tuesday, June 14th, and Wednesday, June 15th, an entire change of program every evening consisting of 80 fine moving pictures. 80 is a lot. The dress circle and parquet, that would be the downstairs seats, cost 50 cents and the balcony costs 25 cents and there are no reserved seats. Nor, frankly, my friends, did there need to be with 1,200 seats available and the proceeds, as you see, to be devoted toward the celebration of our national holiday, the 4th of July. And there's a committee, Orfila, Abrams, and Triple, which pretty much sums up the ethnic diversity of Tucson in 1898. And remember, we're still Arizona territory. We are not a state yet. So um, they're celebrating our national holiday in the same way that they probably would be celebrating um, Mexican Independence Day in September as well. So this gives you an idea of what the venue and the program might look like. And I'm going to show you a few of the very first Lumiere films that made their way around the United States. And so you can see sort of what they might have been seeing there in 1898. This is an 1895 short from the Lumieres. All of them were short. Uh, called La Rousseur à Rosé or Le Jardinier, which is The Sprinkler Sprinkled or The Gardener. And this, we think, is the very first film uh, comedy, a slapstick comedy, and um, it takes less than a minute to watch, so enjoy. This Lumiere film is believed to be one of the first home movies. This is, um, I think, Antoine Lumiere and his wife and their baby. And the film is Le Repas de Bébé, or The Baby's Tea Time, 1895 as well, one of that first program shown in December of 1895. People love this. Everybody loves babies on screen. As Bertrand Tavernier, the French director, points out, um, it's a French baby, so there's a bottle of cognac on the table. <laughs> but what people really found fascinating about this was the wind blowing the trees in the background. That cap capturing of movement was really amazing to or original audiences. Enjoy.
but whether or not you're a film aficionado, um, you may have heard or known about this film, L'arrivée du train à La Ciota, The Arrival of the Train in La Ciota Station in the south of France. This is the one that apocryphally uh, we are told frightened people so much they fell out of their seats as the locomotive came racing toward them. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but it makes for a great story. What's really interesting and um, exciting about this particular piece of cinema is that it uses something that becomes a standard in cinema. When something's coming right at you, you don't meet it head on, but instead you use a diagonal um, perspective so that the approaching entity comes to fill more and more and more of the frame without uh, blurring out the um, proportions. So the, this is an amazing little moment, and it was just meant sort of to document, here comes the train. But the contrast of black and white, the movement of the figures, as opposed to the movement of the train, really create a kind of symphony of image. So enjoy. Ever since the filming of the very first moving image western, The Great Train Robbery in 1893, audiences were crazy for westerns, and many film companies started sending crews out to the west to capture the landscape and exotica of western vistas. Uh, I should add, The Great Train Robbery was shot in the wilds of New Jersey, <laughs> and the cowboys were peeking through um, birch trees rather than dodging around cacti. The Lubin Company of Philadelphia sent a crew west in 1912 along the Southern Pacific Railroad route through Texas, Colorado, and in New Mexico and Arizona, also using the Santa Fe. Uh, railroad, uh, two special railroad cars, wardrobe for 40 men, who could be soldiers, cowboys, Mexicans, or Indians, a wardrobe for 25 women, firearms, tack for 15 horses, and the Lubin Troop of 30 actors, actresses, cameramen, crew, and business people. So they would come into these towns and they would hire locals as extras, of course, and uh, hire the horses and often, you know, hire people to do the what, what's now called craft services, but in the day was probably just called food. <laughs> so, so Lubin's activities in Arizona are the focus of a little bit of our interest today. We know from newspaper records that um, the Lubin crew arrived in Arizona sometime in March, and were coming uh, west from El Paso Juarez. They moved to Douglas and used the Gadsden Hotel as a location. This is, of course, a color photograph of the Gadsden Hotel in all its glory, but um, it served well in black and white. And local people were more than happy to provide locations and services. Everybody was a little starstruck in the early days of the movies, as they sometimes are now. And so um, the El Paso Herald reports in April of 1912 that the moving picture company is located at Tucson and making western pictures near that city at the old mission of San Javier. They established a studio in El Paso but ended up um, moving to Tucson because they had a little trouble with some um, cross-the-border interactions 
and uh, thought that Tucson would be a safer venue. Remember, this at this point, the Mexican Revolution is starting up. So El Paso and Nogales, for example, would have been a little more fraught a venue than Tucson. And Lubin did establish a Western studio in Tucson for a little bit, as we shall see. The Star reports on April 10th, 1912, that Mr. Lubin believes the climatic conditions are so favorable in Arizona for light and other photographic requisites that he will establish a troupe and studio at Tucson. He was not the first and he was not the last to say almost that exact same thing. Tucson is and has always been extremely attractive to the industry. And Lubin was just one in a long line of studios that tried to establish a toehold here. As the article goes on, the following photodrama is the first made by the company in the vicinity of the city. The scene is the Mission San Javier. 100 films will reach the ends of the world and be seen by probably 65 million people. He means 100 prints of the same film, not 100 different films <laughs> about the mission. And uh, so the film is called The Renunciation, and you know, it's a sort of star-crossed lovers, do the right thing for the person you love kind of story, directed by Wilbert Melville, the long-suffering company manager, dog's buddy, um, director, <laughs> sometimes editor. Uh, he had to corral the, the uh, actors. He had to make sure everybody made it back across the Mexico border so they could leave in the morning, all those kinds of things. Now, the interesting backstory here is that um, everybody was really excited to have Lumen here for a while, and then sentiment began to change, as it did and had back in El Paso. Perhaps the best known and certainly the most reported upon film made by the Lubin Company while it was based in Tucson is The Sleeper. The Sleeper was uh, written and directed by Romaine Fielding who made quite a career as a director, actor, cinerist. Uh, as you see there's a list here of his credits the Romance of the Border, The New Ranch Foreman, The Ranger's Reward, A Western Courtship, and The Sandstorm all lost. And I may have mentioned that 90% um, of all films made before 1920 were um, destroyed or burned, so we don't have them. And possibly 50% of all films made before 1950, when the industry changed to safety film, 50% of those films are lost. So Lost films do turn up from time to time, and we're going to see an example of one of them in a few moments. But film from this period is pretty, pretty sparse and pretty precious. So the most we can know about some of these films is um, plot descriptions and cast lists and um, other sort of business deals about them or details about them. And so what we know about The Sleeper is that it was a Rip Van Winkle story using Tucson's Barrios as the past and the commercial downtown along Congress Street as the present and it had a gold rush plot and indeed was also known by its subtitle the gold rush. So the production involved the Santa Fe Railroad, three to four hundred Anglo extras, 75 to 100 Mexican American extras, burros, props, tools, etc. Of course people um, to provide food and lodgings and laundry services and people to hold the reflectors and all sorts of other uh, aspects of filmmaking. The locations were downtown streetscapes, the Arizona Daily Star offices, interior and exterior. They were on Church Street opposite the Pima County Courthouse, the modern one. Um, Sentinel Peak, which was not yet quite a mountain. And Romaine Fielding was famously quoted as saying, if I want to get pictures of the old town in its famous frontier days, all I have to do is go down on Meyer Street. If I want something modern, all I have to do is take the machine and company in the newer residence sections or the business sections. 
1912, the newer residence sections would be, gosh, um, Sam Hughes probably, West University, um, maybe a little bit of Armory Park, although it was a railroad neighborhood. And so really quite close to town still. So we see here an ad showing that the Clifton Air Dome, which was an open air uh, theater, was screening the sleeper that um, Tucson Lubin picture known as the Gold Rush. Don't miss seeing it. And the Air Dome, like I said, was an open air theater. And then on uh, rainy and stormy nights, we show uh, the Clifton Theater indoors. So. Uh, this was kind of a big deal, and um, you know, the whole town turned out, as they say, to participate in the filming of the sleeper. As time went on, however, and the Lubin company moved on to California, the city fathers and business people were left slightly um, jaded and their eyes were a little narrower the next time a movie company came to town because the Lubins left with a lot of unpaid bills and uh, a lot of broken hearts and <laughs> a lot of soured romances um, amongst the young people but also amongst the um, business community who had ho really hoped to get rich off of this enterprise. So they picked up, they got on the train and off they went to California soon to be followed by Eclair Films, and uh, so we'll turn to that now. On the heels of the Lubin Company's departure to California with unpaid bills left in its wake came Eclair Films two years later, a French company with an American branch that joined with Universal as its distributor and um, functioned as American Eclair. They came to Tucson in 1914 to make a series of westerns, and as far as we know, The Girl Stage Driver is the only surviving film. The fact that it's a surviving film is a wonderful story. Um, and as you see here in the text on the right, it was preserved in 2012 at Film Tech from a 35mm nitrate release print found at the New Zealand Film Archive. So what, one of, as I mentioned, many, many films from the silent era are lost through fires or um, disposal. So it's really a cause for great excitement when a lost silent film turns up. In 2012, a film archivist from Los Angeles was on vacation in New Zealand and went to the New Zealand Film Archive and said, well, do you have any early American films? I'm always on the lookout. And they had, I think it was two or three hundred American films that had been considered lost. Thus began a process to get these films repatriated and preserved and digitized. So, you know, there were many, many fascinating titles, among them an uh, early film by John Ford that was considered lost, an early Hitchcock that everyone thought was gone. And for our purposes here in Tucson, the girl stage driver uh, was so exciting. It was filmed on the grounds of the Convento and on the west side of the Santa Cruz. So we get glimpses of what that territory was like at the time. Um, some of you may have seen this film screened in its entirety at uh, Film Festival Tucson a few years ago. Uh, program that portion of the festival, usually with a silent film made in this area, if we can find one. Not always a silent one, but uh, we try to do local content, at least for one special program. You can stream, stream the complete extant film at the Film Preservation uh, website, www.filmpreservation.org. That is the home of the National Film Preservation Foundation that funded, in collaboration with the Museum of Art, the restoration and digitization of the girl stage driver. Uh, we, we have a print here that doesn't have uh, sound, obviously, it's a silent film, and it was brought back to life without an accompanying score because when it was distributed originally, 
local um, musicians would provide the musical accompaniment. So that's how it came to us, and that gives me the benefit of being able to talk you through the clips, and you should be able to hear me. So in the next couple of slides, we'll look at some still photographs and some clips from this recovered wonder, 106 years old, the girl stage driver. The plot is a fairly standard Western melodrama. Um, the stage driver, who is pledged not only to carry passengers, but the mail, is set upon by bandits and killed and his plucky daughter takes up the reins to make sure that the mail gets through and to bring those miscreants to justice. The, um, the bad guys are definitely racially designated. The El Paso Kid is one of them, and you see him here in a store in full um, charro costume, ready to make the best of the situation as he finds it. He discovers that uh, he can rob the mail and also that a prospector is sending his jar of gold dust back east for his daughter's wedding. So the bad guys, the banditos, decide that they're going to rob the stage and the stage driver uh, resists and they kill him. Then the girl, as I said, takes up the reins and here's what happens. Well, as you saw in that sequence, uh, Ruth, the daughter, is fearless and quite capable. She can uh, drive a team of horses, steer a stagecoach apparently with her back feet, and um, shoot both a rifle and a pistol at the same time. But she is overtaken by the banditos and tied to the side of the stagecoach in a sort of slave girl-like posture while the sheriff wanders around on, in one shot he actually seems to be up on Mount Lemon and trying to find where she is. When he arrives he's not a whole lot of help. He <laughs> is captured by the bandits and thrown down a creekside and as you see Ruth repels to the rescue to liberate the poor sheriff and then go, uh, she will liberate him and go after the bad guys who've taken the loot. Edna Payne, who was cast in the role of Ruth, um, people criticize her acting, but I don't think anybody hired her for her acting. They hired her for the fact that she could ride, she could drive a team, she could shoot, and apparently she could also rappel down ropes. 
So she was pretty much the, the total package in terms of finding an actress, a stunt woman, and um, <laughs> muleteer to fulfill the role of Ruth, the girl stage driver. This is uh, one of many films made in this period that show the capabilities of the new woman. Now, still before World War I, so we're not getting flappers yet, but these are the flappers, big sisters, and aunties. And they are um, wearing split skirts, and they are not riding side saddle, and they are shooting at the bad guys, and in fact, this poor sheriff, who's obviously conceded to his fate here, uh, is dependent on her wits and capabilities to get him out of a fix. Well, the exciting climax of the film comes as Ruth goes off to discover the bad guys, uh, rides up to them. Here she is on the grounds of the convento. She can hear them laughing and chortling over their hall as they argue about how they're going to split up the loot and falling around on the ground. The foreground action is distracting, but don't miss looking at the adobe uh, site of the convento here, because apart from a few still pictures, we don't have a lot of uh, images of it. So there she is with her six-shooter, holding them at gunpoint. There are two of them and only one of her, and yet they're so startled by her fierceness that they obey. And what is she going to do with these guys? She's going to put them down the well. They don't really believe her. <laughs> it's a great solution, right? If you um, can't tie them up, you might as well put them down the well. Take out the handle so they, they uh, can be cranked down to the absolute bottom. Send the second one after his compadre. She really means it. Leave the gold dust. Your gun? She doesn't seem to disarm them. Down they go. And under threat of being shot like fish in a barrel, they send the rope back up so that they cannot escape. And off Ruth goes to save the day. As Western novels became some of the best sellers of the day, so film adaptations of Western novels became extremely popular and pretty good economic bets, even as the U.S. headed towards engagement with World War I. The Light of Western Stars, based on a Zane Grey novel, was shot in Texas Canyon and perhaps a little bit on Mount Lemmon. It's another lost film. We do know that it stars Dustin Farnham, and it's his first super picture. I'm not quite sure what that means. Dustin Farnham was from Bucksport, Maine, a town I know a little bit because I work with a regional film archive that's based there. By all accounts, Dustin Farnham sounded like, you know, an old Mainer, so he had that Down East accent. His was not a career that made it into the world of sound, therefore, because he couldn't really gain credibility as a Western cowpoke if he sounded like he'd just come off a lobster boat. But these are really tantalizing stills that have survived. Uh, from the light of Western stars, and the next one is even more interesting in terms of location shooting. I would just draw your attention to the variety of um, flora here and the camera on its tripod perched on that rock in Texas Canyon. 
Here we see another variant of um, where to put the camera, perched on another rock, this one apparently on Mount Lemmon, as um, there's Dustin Farnham being directed to <laughs> go west, young man, apparently. The original photograph, the scan didn't come out quite as accurately, but from the original photograph you can tell they are up really high. It had to have been in the Catalinas and probably on Mount Lemmon, not in Texas Canyon because the valley floor is so much further down. Um, so this shows you that, you know, being a cameraman in this period was a pretty active job. <laughs> and, and it's a miracle that these films got made at all, and it's a shame that they don't survive. One film that does survive is The Mine with the Iron Door, based on the novel by Harold Bell Wright, another Western novelist whose work was on the bestseller list for all of the 1920s. And this particular film was made the year after the publication of the novel. The novel was published in 1923, and the, the crew came out from Hollywood in 24 to shoot on location in Arizona. You may know that Harold Bell Wright was a tuberculosis patient and settled in Arizona, lived here for about a decade, wrote several of his best-selling novels here, and there is a neighborhood on the east side of Tucson at, um, let's see, Wilmot and Speedway, roughly. Um, that surrounds the land that he bought and his original house called Harold Bell Wright Estates. And when the site was developed, the street names were drawn from his characters, two of whom appear in this particular film based on his novel. This film print was found in the Moscow Film Archive by someone connected to the Tucson Historic Preservation Foundation Many of you may know Damian Klinko, the president of THPF, and he was the one who facilitated the return of that print to the U.S. and the digitization and the screening for the Rialto Theater's 90th birthday some years ago. That would have been in 2010. So I was involved in that screening as well. We, um, Damian commissioned a new musical score, and <laughs> he and I did the sound effects including the sound effects for the monsoon scene, which we will see in a moment. This particular novel um, is set in Canyon del Oro and is about the lost iron door mine and the quest for gold and whether all that glitters is gold or not. The tagline is, gold is where you find it. Okay. Um, starring Dorothy McHale as Marta Hillgrove. Marta Hillgrove is the name of one of the streets in Harold Bell Wright Estates neighborhood. And Raymond Hatton as the villain, the lizard. Raymond Hatton had a long career and a long connection to Tucson. He um, played a lot of scurrilous villains in the silent era and then um, sort of second and third and fourth banana in a lot of westerns made at old Tucson in the sound era. Dropping down to um, Robert Fraser playing Natachi. Natachi is one of the uh, street names as well in Harold Bell Wright and Natachi is a Harvard educated Apache who has come back to his traditional homelands and gets involved in the plot of the mine with the iron door. As you see in the LA Times blurb here, the wood company will depart shortly for Arizona, the locale of the story. As in the case of Where a Man's a Man, the first right story to be made by principal, this story will be filmed on the exact location pictured by the author. And indeed, it was filmed on, um, on Mount Lemmon and in Cañada del Oro. These two establishing shots show um, the Tucson Valley, nicely framed by saguaros, probably from um, Tumamoc, possibly, or um, Sentinel Peak, overlooking the river, which has water in it, and the tiny little downtown of Tucson, that's on the left, and on the right we see the um, Upper Oracle Road area, Cañada del Oro area now, uh, with the two prospectors, uh, Bob and Thad. 
The gray bars across the lower portion of the frame are masking time codes. The print that came out from Moscow Film Archive was actually, let's see, a print that had French intertitles and then was only sent to the West with a time code on it so that it couldn't be mastered and sent out, you know, by some um, film distribution company for profit. So this is really just a screener. Uh, we're lucky to have access to it at all. I've appended here the opening line of Wright's novel, The Mine with the Iron Door, and I think you will find that he had a good feel for our little burg. From every street and corner in Tucson we see the mountains. From our businesses, from our railway depots and hotels, from our university campus and halls, and from the windows and porches of our homes, we look up to the mighty hills. And I should also add that he dedicates the book to his friends in the old Pueblo. I don't know if that's the first use of that moniker for our city, but it's certainly um, a catchy one. In this clip, the partners are uh, hunting for gold and they need some water. So they go to the cabin of Sonora Jack where they discover this beautiful little child and um, ask, what's your name, kiddo? And <laughs> the little boy says, Daisy. Oh, the little boy is a girl. And the partners are horrified that she is living with Sonora Jack and his female relative. <laughs> so they decide they're going to take this little Anglo child with them. And there's a little bit of resistance. But ultimately, they offer violence to the locals and take the girl away with them. Of course, the flaxen-haired, blue-eyed Anglo child. Because this is a translation from the French, where Thad didn't really translate, that particular character's name is Tiff in the French version. Finally, they decide to keep Daisy with them. Here they are prospecting in the creek in Cañada del Oro while Daisy is playing in the fire. <laughs> and we learn that um, this has become a very early experiment in co-parenting. Bob and Thad have found a little bit of gold, but meanwhile she has burned her hand and each of them has a week at a time when he is her main father and so they argue about you know who's her daddy when she gets hurt and who's her daddy when she's doing well <laughs> she called them both papa much can be made of this particular arrangement but um, I leave that for another day so as Daisy grows up, gossip surrounds the fact that she has two papas and no mama. And finally, Raymond Hatton, the lizard, says some pretty nasty things to her to the effect that, you know, you don't have two fathers. You don't even have a name. Nobody knows who you are. You're just some orphan. And Daisy, who's never thought about this before, is devastated at the thought that she is... Um, a parentless child and so she wanders home in what turns out to be quite an astonishing rainstorm. Daisy having learned the secret of her uh, absent parentage wanders home and into the path of a monsoon storm the likes of which we haven't seen around here in quite some time. This is quite a remarkable sequence and I'm playing the whole thing for you because it really is not just a marvel of early filmmaking but also just incredibly beautiful to look at. The blue tinting would have been done after uh, the filming and processing as part of the post-production and the lightning bolts were probably overlaid 
but um, you, you can't fake this kind of water. They didn't use models. They filmed a flash flood. They f filmed the desert under the rainstorm and um, kind of like Lillian Gish floating down the ice flows in D.W. Griffith's um, Way Down East. You know, this is quite a dramatic climatic scene, climatic and climactic scene in an early work. Daisy isn't really paying attention, but her horse is, and it leads her to safety. Meanwhile, we get a, in a lightning flash a quick glimpse of Natachi, who has come out in land which is, after all, his birthright, and seen her wandering around and leads her to his cabin in a, in a state of collapse and kind of nurses her back to health and talks to her because he's Harvard trained doctor he uh, can speak to her and tell her about the history of this land Early sound began in 1927 and was fully adopted throughout the United States and most of the world by 1929. That ushers in a, a whole new era of movie making around the world and in Tucson. But I wanted to leave you this week with the news of um, the closing of Old Tucson with a shot from the film that started it all, Arizona, in 1940. This does have sound, and it has a lovely shot of Tucson, um, with old Tucson standing in for our old Pueblo. Thank you for your kind attention, and we'll talk to you at the Q&A. Well, there she is, Tucson. Tucson!